All right, I think we are making progress. I have, um, I'm uploading these on YouTube and hopefully we'll be sending them off to you shortly. So um, this is uh, the part three of our first week and this is about uh, the materials that you're reading, right? Um, one of the things that uh, happens uh, when we're working with people who are suffering either physically, spiritually, or emotionally is that out of our own discomfort, uh, sometimes with the level of pain that we see, uh, we try to offer a quick fix, right? To ease their pain and suffering uh, by trying to offer what we think they need. The difficulty in doing this is that we often bypass um, what they really need, which is to have us help them hold this burden that they're bearing, uh, to be one who will sit with them and hear and feel their pain and their suffering offering them assurance that they are valuable and they are loved. As Martha Jacobs noted in her reflection on her own personal theology in this week's reading assignment, uh, she noted that if she had offered quick forgiveness for Sam for stealing the candy bar when he was a child, she would have missed an opportunity to hear his own struggle, to hear the burden that he's carried, to hear um, how he viewed God and God in his life and God's forgiveness to him. If she had made light of it and excused it as just a childhood mistake, he would not have he would not have opened up to her, and he would have continued to carry this burden with him. He needed somebody to just hear his story, to validate his feelings, and to help him understand how his God can love him and care for him and forgive him, and to learn how to forgive himself. It's important that we do work to be able to just meet them where they're at, right? Even though you're likely ministering to people in your own congregation who identify as Presbyterians, folks who folks come with all of their own family history, church and faith history, cultural and social views. Um, we must not assume that just because we worship in the same uh, pews that we know what it means for them to be Presbyterian or their understanding of God or forgiveness uh, or their understanding of God as father or mother. If they've had a father or a father figure in their life who was abusive, um, the view of God as father may be traumatizing rather than comforting. We also must not assume that just because we have had a loved one die or that we would be sad if our loved one died that our parishioner feels the same way, right? I had a situation in the hospital where a young woman's father had died and I had not met her before her father's death. She was coming to see him after he had died and I met her in the room and um, we just were at such different places, right? I was making an assumption that because I love my father and would be deeply sad if he died that she felt the same way and quite the opposite. I learned that her father was very abusive to her physically, sexually, um, that she, she never had an opportunity for them to reconcile or process that or work through that, right? And so what she was actually feeling was a great deal of relief that he was gone, uh, as well as some guilt that she was feeling relieved. And I needed to be able to meet her where she was at and be able to hear her story and understand her pain and set aside what I thought she might be thinking or feeling. One of the things that you'll read about and the things that I discovered in my work um, is that many times, even if people are not, um, if they don't consider themselves to be uh, big prayers, right, or big on ritual, that oftentimes in times of crisis and distress, they find comfort in some of those familiar words or rituals. Um, saying the Lord's Prayer or singing familiar hymns can be so comforting to them. Um, I had this happen many times with uh, being at a hospital in St. Paul, which is largely Catholic. Um, many folks who consider themselves lapsed Catholics, or they would call themselves um, C and E Catholics, right? They would go to church on Christmas and Easter. Um, that when somebody was hospitalized, they, they wanted the priest, the hospital priest to come. Even if they didn't have their own priest, a church that they went to anymore, they wanted the hospital priest to come. They wanted the rituals and the blessings and, and to receive the sacrament of sick, the things that made them 
feel that 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 deeper part of their faith was being attended to. Right. Another thing um, that's so important is not to make assumptions about what people want to pray for. Right. Um, to be able to ask them if they want prayer, and to be able to ask them what it is that they would like to pray for and about, and for whom. Um, pastoral care is about helping them find and tap into their religious and spiritual resources, right? To help them gather the people around them that they turn to for emotional support. Um, and, and so to be able to invite them to share what they need prayers for is a really powerful thing, especially at a time if they're in the hospital where they feel like they don't have a lot of control about anything that's happening to them. Now, one of the reasons that we do the genogram and do the verbatims is that uh, it is so important to know yourself, right? Part of having you do so much of this internal work is about you really being able to understand your own stuff, the stuff that can get triggered for you when you are providing pastoral care to others, right? The things that will get in the way of you being able to provide meaningful and appropriate pastoral care to those who are in your care. The verbatim and genogram are designed to take a look inside yourself, to look at your family of origin and how your experiences growing up might be impacting you being able to be with, to sit with, and to offer care to those in your congregations. In David Plummer's reflection uh, on his personal theology in the, in the reading this week, he talks about the importance of identifying his own core values right, that he needed to understand about himself as a chaplain. He created his personal theologies of honesty, integrity, and consistency, as well as advocacy, relevancy, and understanding of the human condition, and understanding God's grace. Many times in my work at the hospital, I was called to minister to individuals who had been accused of crimes, of injuring or killing another person accidentally or intentionally, to be able to offer pastoral care to them because they are human beings in need of care can be very challenging. To be able to care for another human being without prejudice, believing that they are a child of God and in need of emotional and spiritual support perhaps more than anyone else in that moment. This can be such a challenge. You may not be dealing with people, working with people who have such extreme situations like I've experienced in the hospital. However, you are likely to have people who have made very poor decisions that have hurt themselves or hurt others, either literally or, fig or figuratively, right? Emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. And sometimes it's hard to understand um, what, what has led them to that. But the importance of being able to sit with them is what they really need as they struggle to come to terms with some of their choices that they've made. Too often, I have seen chaplains, families, pastors, priests, etc., and my own self included, sometimes spending too much time in one hospital room and not allow the patient or the immediate family some time to themselves. Often this comes out of our own sense of discomfort and not knowing what to do, but just feeling like we should be there uh, and feeling like we just need to stick around, even though the family or the, the, the patient and they're doing what they need to do, right? We're almost a fly on the wall rather than an active presence. Um, we, don't want to, we don't want that to happen, right? Oftentimes people don't need or want really lengthy visits, especially in the hospital. Uh, they just want to know that you're there and offering support. Um, at home, sometimes they may not want a long or lengthy visit, but sometimes they do. And so it's important to assess and find out what they need and want and not just assume. Okay. One thing that distinguishes effective pastoral care from what I'm just going to call a really nice visit with a good cup of coffee is doing the work of an assessment. If we believe that we are more than just a general visitor, right, and we take our role as spiritual leaders seriously, then it is imperative that we have some way to assess what is needed and to provide appropriate interventions. 
in the book, it talks about following the medical model of physicians, of listening, observing, evaluating, and determining interventions to be what interventions would be necessary, right? And we can follow this model as well, right? Depending on the situation in a crisis, however, we might have to do this in 10 or 15 minutes, uh, and sometimes it might take a little bit longer. But being able to sit and listen to the parishioner, listen to hear their story, hear what they're telling you, and to be able to sift through their stories and identify the important pieces that are hidden underneath the message, right? To be able to observe what you see in their actions and behaviors, who is present in the room and who is absent. Uh, what do you see if you're visiting them in the hospital uh, or a nursing home? Do you see evidence of who they are and who is important to them? If you are visiting them at home, do you see pictures, books, anything that tells you what's important to them? Being able to evaluate the information that you're gathering from your listening and your observing, and then determining what is going to be most helpful for them in the moment, what they need, this is where our own stuff can really get in the way, where our own needs and issues, if we don't set them aside, can get in the way, and the things that we offer may not be the things that are needed. Right? It becomes more about our emotional needs than the person in front of us. Dr. Viktor Frankl wrote that the goal is to find out what a person lives for, what is important to them as they are facing a terrible disease or crisis that forces them to re-examine their identity and their priorities, to help them identify what it is that brings meaning and purpose to their life. When working with families and decision-making for loved ones, working with meaning and purpose can be very challenging. Family members often will have different things that are important to them and different values that bring meaning and purpose into their life, different values that they live by. And they can bring their stuff into the moment when they're supposed to be making decisions for their loved one, where they're not considering what their loved one wants, but they're thinking about what would make me more comfortable. Being able to help them navigate through their values and priorities and being able to help them get to a point where they're able to think about what their loved one would want and what their loved one's values are is a really important piece of what we do, especially in the hospital setting, right? What is in the best interest of the patient? What do they want? What's important for them? And sometimes we need to sift through a lot of family stuff before we can get to that important piece. Now many pastors and chaplains have been told at different times in their lives that one of their gifts is that they are a good listener. I know I've heard that, I'm sure you have heard that, and I know that it is true, that you are all probably very good listeners. I want to encourage you to examine if you are really good at spiritually supportive listening. Right? This is something that takes a great deal of intentionality, skill, and restraint. Spiritually supportive listening is about healing, strengthening, and guiding. It is about transforming an experience and understanding and identifying the emotions behind them. One of the things that was hardest for me in the beginning of my chaplaincy was experience was being comfortable with silence. As an extrovert and as a good conversationalist, I was more comfortable filling up the silence rather than sitting in the silence. In pastoral care, the beauty of silence is that it allows quiet time and space for the speaker, perhaps your parishioner, to process what has been said and what they are feeling and to move forward thoughtfully. Too many times we can be so focused on what we want to say next or the other extreme, our mind wanders and we are not really listening at all. In either case, we find it hard to stay in the present moment and focus on the listener. Developing the skills, these basic responses to being a good listener will be important in your ministry. It is important when you're listening to someone to listen to their feelings rather than focusing on the facts. In this way, you're telling them that you really are paying attention and you're taking the conversation to a deeper level by exploring the feelings rather than just the facts that are presented. 
too often uh, folks get bogged down in the facts of the story and they miss the important feeling underneath it. And when we do that, we never get to move the conversation forward in that deep and meaningful way. Right? When we do listen for the feelings and hone in on those and explore them more deeply, the speaker knows that they have a right to move the conversation forward or not, right? Gently encouraging the conversation into deeper topics and picking up on how is that going for them? Are they joining? Are they pulling back? Can you help them move through it a little bit more or, or identify with them that it feels like they're just not able to go there yet, right? And that that's okay too. Chapter 10 talks about knowing how individuals connect emotionally to their beliefs is critical in providing support. People feel heard, valued, and respected when they know that their pastor is taking the time to listen to their story, to hear their pain, to understand their fears, and not be afraid to go deep with them. How their church, religious, or spiritual life has treated them in the past is what they will believe when they are faced with tragedy or crisis in the present moment. If the church has hurt them, or abandoned them, or disappointed them, they will be less likely to believe that their faith is going to be helpful to them in the present moment. One of the questions uh, for your discussion is about scripture. right? Offering simple scriptural quotes, church teachings when somebody has been or felt shamed or guilted by someone in authority in the church is not going to be comforted and in fact they might feel judged or wounded all over again. Being mindful of what scripture guides you is important for you, but being open to how scripture can be helpful or harmful in the moment as you're working with your parishioner is critical to how they're going to receive your pastoral care. Now your work in pastoral care, your work with your parishioners, uh, one of the, a big role that you will be in your community is an advocate, right? advocacy and social justice, right? To be able to advocate for parishioners who might need appropriate mental health care that's not available in your community, to be able to work for social justice in order to have resources available when your parishioners and community are in need so that they don't have to travel miles and miles to get the support and care that they deserve to have. That's why that second assignment is really gonna be helpful for you, right? An opportunity for you to really identify what resources are available or are not available in your community. So your weekly assignment is your reflection assignment, um, the two-page reflection paper on your pastoral development and personal theology of pastoral care. There are four questions in the assignment details on the syllabus for you to respond to. And then the two questions, discussion questions. One, how would you define pastoral care and the role it plays in ministry? And two, what scriptures provide the foundation for your thoughts about pastoral care? And remember to respond to two of your colleagues' discussion posts as well. Uh, and have a great week, and I look forward to reading your papers and to uh, participating with you in the discussion post this week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.